So uh, welcome, welcome to everyone. Um, just as a reminder, the uh, purpose of, uh, oops, uh, so welcome everyone. Uh, the, just as a reminder, the purpose of this session is to uh, provide a, a whirlwind uh, introduction to, uh, to agent-based modeling and uh, particularly um, some guidance on the mechanics of building up an agent-based model using one of the prevalent agent-based modeling platforms to wit any logic. I'm a uh, heavy user of different platforms over the years, uh, from uh, Repast uh, to, to NetLogo, some to any logic, uh, and uh, recently have been um, uh, evaluating some of the epistemics FRED platform. Um, I've also uh, done quite a lot of agent-based modeling and other packages. Um, AnyLogic is a competitive package and it is uh, the go-to package for hybrid modeling involving all three major system science traditions, uh, agent-based modeling, system dynamics modeling, compartmental modeling, and uh, discrete event simulation. Um, and that's what we'll be using today. Um, now, uh, this is designed to be the first of two or three tutorials. Um, I'm not going to be able to impart uh, uh, enormous uh, depth of knowledge on both the conceptual side and the practical side, pragmatic side of building and implementing these models. Um, but I do think it will expose you to a lot of the key core issues with the models. Um, I will be offering an economy of comments here compared to what I would normally offer um, in an introduction conceptually to agent-based models on the one hand, or the exercises I'd pursue in, in my boot camps, for example, which provide very detailed uh, guidance on, on building up models. Um, responsive to the fact that uh, most or all of the people here are coming from a uh, course on, um, on that combines system and data science um, for infectious disease modeling, for communicable disease. The uh, examples that I'll be focusing, on which I'll be focusing, um, in all of these sessions will be ones from the communicable and infectious disease area. Um, and that will start uh, this evening. Um, uh, so um, with those, uh, with that preface uh, offered, um, uh, I will go and offer some conceptual comments on, um, on agent-based models before we uh, dive into some of the mechanics of, of building these models uh, within the AnyLogic platform. Um, to that end, I'm going to share my screen uh, and we will begin the presentation. So um, uh, within this course, uh, uh, the, the fields course, the MPD-898, um, uh, I've introduced uh, the basics of compartmental modeling. And compartmental modeling fits into the broader paradigm of, of system science as one of three dynamic modeling methods. Um, uh, the other um, method that is quite uh, prevalent within the infectious disease area, communicable disease modeling area, is agent-based modeling. Um, although I won't discuss it here, you'll find plenty of material online discussing discrete event simulation and it's uh, hybridization with one or both of these other two techniques, um, including for its application in uh, infectious and communicable disease modeling. Uh, discrete event simulation um, has uh, enormous uh, power, um, uh, conciseness, uh, expressiveness, um, uh, and insightfulness that it can offer uh, when it comes to service, uh, service delivery related to these. But that's outside of our, our scope here. Just be aware that we'll be exploring um, another major tradition, but discrete event modeling um, is germane even in the infectious and communicable disease area when it comes to particularly intersection with um, care delivery or, or formal healthcare processes for testing, contact tracing, et cetera. Um, and if there were demand for it, I could probably you know, cover a little bit of, of the basics of that in a later session. So agent-based models um, are defined um, by the fact that they include one or more populations um, of individual actors, uh, which we term agents, 
that are largely uh, that are treated as, as autonomous. They have a certain state and they have a certain behavior. We characterize those agents um, uh, as, as being associated with a set of uh, characteristics which are le listed here. They include characteristics that are more or less um, fixed for a given agent, although they may be heterogeneous over the population as a whole, they're fixed for a given agent. Things like uh, ethnicity, for example, um, uh, uh, and uh, these parameters um, will will capture some of these uh, these quantities um, that characterize a given agent uh, in a in a static way in a continuous frame as well as a discrete one. So ethnicity be, might be treated discreetly for a given model. There might be continuous characteristics like birth weight or income, for example, which might be treated as on a sliding scale of sorts. Um, and they can be relational as well. Parameters can say, you know, um, this other agent is my mother, um, or this other agent uh, is a sibling, or this other agent is a friend. So we have relational um, attributes, relational parameters. Um, I call them parameters because they're they're not varying or varying only um, episodically or, or rarely. We also have state for agents. Um, so each agent maintains its own state, um, and uh, that dis distinguishes it uh, according to um, an evolving process. Uh, so it may have an age, and that age evolves, uh, grows older over time, inevitably. Um, a smoking status that changes over time, quitting, relapsing, um, initiating smoking. Um, uh, they could have networks, which could be dynamic, and therefore part of their state. Um, um, you know, relations which are not fixed, but which are evolving, and, and preferences that change over time. Beyond these, we often talk about agents as, as having actions which change said state, which modify that state, and rules for evolving, um, uh, or, or dictating when those actions fire, when they when they apply, um, and um, and then some means of interaction with other agents or and or the surrounding environment. This is really important for agent-based modeling. It tends to be less prominent in the cognate area of micro simulation modeling, which is widely used in governmental circles and has a long and um, esteemed uh, history. Um, uh, but um, agent-based modeling really prizes understanding how the the observed emergent dynamics of a population as a whole, for example, or large parts of a population, might reflect uh, interactions between agents. Then we have for the model a time horizon of some sort, um, and uh, whether it's continuous or sort of brought up, uh, distinguished into a set of ticks or chunks that by which it steps um, through which it steps between. Um, and then some initial state. So for example, in the model, we might say there's a population of, of agents and when we run the model and run time and uh, execution time at simulation time, we see a set of individual agents. Um, those agents will be associated with parameters such as those here. Um, and again, those would be unchanging characteristics. State might include a variety of types of state and generally an agent will have several different kind of spheres or domains um, dimensions of changing state as it were so they might be changing with respect to fertility whether they're pregnant or not with respect to infection um, uh, in a way that might hew to some common distinctions within system dynamics or compartmental models such as between susceptible infected um, and exposed, infected, and recovered, where exposed reflects uh, people who are latently infected. And typically in a given agent, and this is quite unlike um, uh, compartmental or system dynamics modeling at an aggregate level, quite unlike an aggregate model, a given agent um, can be characterized on the one hand with one of these state charts for their characteristics with respect to one dimension of changing state and with respect to another state chart for another dimension of, of state. And they're in exactly one of these states, these simple states for each of these state charts. So they might be susceptible and seeking care. Well, they'll be unlikely susceptible, 
but um, uh, but not and not open to seeking care, or they might be infective and seeking care, or they might be infective and not open to seeking care. Um, so we can have, you know, we'll have in general one state here and one state here, and we describe these, we characterize these, you know, visibly as if they're orthogonal, they're they're um, independent, but of course there's often interactions and other rules of the agent-based model. Um, will ensure that those invariants are captured. For example, that someone only seeks care when they're exposed or infected. Um, that might be enforced in some other way. But generally we partition out people state into, or agents state into a set of characteristics. Now, it's important for those exposed to compartmental modeling, those exposed to system dynamics modeling, to, uh, to recognize that Agent-based models are kind of like aggregate compartmental or system dynamics model turned on its head. Um, um, and, uh, and particularly within compartmental models, we characterize a system, we, we divide things up. The unit of organization is according to state and characteristics. So we might divide up a population into susceptible, exposed, infected, recovered. You've seen this many times within this very course. Um, and people might proceed between them. Now, if we wanted to distinguish um, uh, people by, by sex to capture, say, different rates of asymptomatic presentation by sex, this might occur for, say, gonorrhea, um, or different care-seeking behaviors by stress, um, you know, by, by sex, um, we would need to have susceptible male susceptible female, so in exposed male, exposed female. In other words, we divide up the model, we organize the model by characteristics of those people grouped, and we count the number of people in any one compartment. So the, the data that circulates is, is the count that, that match those characteristics as indicated by the purpose of a state variable or stock. So susceptible males would count the number of susceptible males on um, people in that state and, and, and category. Um, um, this is in direct contrast to something like agent-based modeling. With an agent-based modeling, we, we instead distinguish people on an individual level. The organization of an agent-based model is for the individuals. Those, that's the fundamental units of organization, the, the individuals. Um, and each individual um, keeps track of their own state uh, over time and their own characteristics. So um, within an aggregate or system dynamics compartmental model, the organization is by, by um, state or, or characteristic and the data is counts. Here in an agent-based model, the organization is by individuals and each individual has data about their characteristics and their state, whether a continuous state or a discrete state. In a compartmental model, everything, all the distinctions are discrete. We have males and females, which is a naturally perhaps discrete category, but in other cases, we might have things like income levels and we'll divide it up into deciles or quartiles or what have you, rather than being able to capture continuous, continuous state. We need to go to a partial differential equation to capture that in a, in a truly continuous fashion. But in nature-based model, there's no problem with that. We just have someone's income, which is a double precision number. Um, or we have their age, um, which changes continuously, et cetera. So um, agent-based modeling is a different way of organizing, um, uh, different organizational philosophy, and the types of information that circulates is, is different. Um, each of these individuals maintains their own, their own state. Another difference in agent-based modeling is that we have um, nested relationships and networked relationships um, uh, between uh, these individuals or, 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 or collections. So we might have um, people in, in multiple networks, uh, people in, um, uh, who, are, who are in a, a network associated with contact patterns, um, um, who they 
with whom they're in contact regularly, for example. Um, and uh, we might further have now different types of networks, right? You could have a person with a family network and um, uh, at the same time, they're characterized by uh, um, uh, a network of friends or a network of needle sharing, people with whom they share needles or, uh, or a, a network associated with colleagues or what have you. Um, and we can, we can capture these. Another uh, feature that we commonly have is spatial dimensions. And so we place people in space um, according to say GIS maps. And we look at patterns that are emergent, not just in time as we did with, with aggregate models, but in terms of, of, of space or, or over their network. So we, we characterize um, patterns that occur accrue perhaps um, over, over space. People may have influence from nearby resources, but they may also affect uh, that the area around them, such as in this case, dropping prions for um, prion-based disease. Um, um, okay, so um, uh, for um, when we have space, we can have emergent patterns on more than time. We can have uh, patterns over time we count the number of agents, say, that match some characteristics, but we also have uh, patterns over space. Um, okay. Um, so uh, in general, we place people into networks. They can be heterogeneous with different types of people connected to each other in a regular way, maybe physicians to physicians, et cetera. And we have uh, networks um, that can give context as well. Okay. Um, uh, now, another important difference from sorts of models with which we've been working in class, um, compartmental models, uh, aggregate models, system dynamics models, but all aggregate, is that um, agent-based models are typically, not invariably, but typically stochastic. There are exceptions. Um, uh, there's a substantial class of cellular automata, which count as agent-based models, things like Conway's game of life that are in fact deterministic. Um, but generally speaking, when we have models of human behavior, um, uh, they're stochastic because people's behavior at a micro level, uh, which is what agent-based models commonly depict, is um, exhibits stochastics, exhibits uncertainties, variability. Uh, and uh, having stochastics, a given run of the model will induce a trajectory in terms of of behaviors, whether it's spatial patterns or or patterns over time, which which is affected by randomness. In order to develop confidence that the results we're seeing are, are capture uh, capture regularities that are meaningful, that have an orderliness that is deeply rooted, we typically run the model many times so we run a so-called ensemble of realizations where each realization if if you want to think mechanically about it in terms of implementation as a random number seed but it plays out over time and and leads to certain behavior being observed um and we'll commonly run it you know 30 times or what have you so a given run might induce some particular number of cases by the end of the model in terms of low socioeconomic group cases or high socioeconomic group cases. Um, but if we run it uh, in, in some number of cases in the low, incident, the low SES population over, over time and high SES, but if we run it many times, we'll find there's a lot of variability. And so what looks like a single line, if we run an ensemble, we may see kind of a, a distribution here. It's not well defined, but you can imagine it being Having being at quite high levels and then sort of tailing off here and being essentially zero um, uh, further up than that. Um, similarly, these uh, cases will induce distributions like this. So a given run would have a given realization would have one particular result for the high SES, one for low SES at the final time. And if we run it many times, we'll see a distribution, um, which may be distinctly not normal in its appearance. Um, uh, okay, um, now it's important to recognize that um, uh, 
notable distinction from aggregate models is it's straightforward to build ABMs that feature multiple levels of context within them in a nested fashion. Um, so we might have an individual person who's nested in a neighborhood or school, um, and 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 uh, that's in a municipality or country, um, or you know a, a feedlot which includes a cow, a cow, cattle, and within them they have bacterial populations, which uh, each of which is characterized by a drug gene resistance network that indicates the degree to which. Um, uh, AMR is built enough, um, antimicrobial resistance. Um, and what's notable here is that um, these can be very fruitfully used for, for insight, for characterizing uh, effects at, at different levels on which we have data, maybe outbreaks in schools, for example, or outbreaks in, in neighborhoods of Toronto or, or outbreaks associated with regions uh, versus a whole province. And in any logic, it's it's actually very easy to build these nested models. Um, um, and so you might have a, a model of cities shown here as squares in a rather stylized fashion. And within each city, there's a scale-free network of individuals who are um, who are interacting with each other, whose degree distribution. Look at the distribution of the number of people to whom a given person is connected. We'll see a power law distribution. Um, um, a distribution in which the kind of the ratio of of the um, fraction of the probability of having two k connections to k is invariant of the size of k. So two hundred connections to one hundred is the same ratio of probabilities as two connections compared to one. Um, and these scale-free laws are, are notable and very easy to capture in the agent-based modeling. We might associate cities with a transport network that reflects flow between them. Um, we might study the spread of infection between these municipalities. Um, so, you know, putting this in a little bit of context, ABMs have, have some notable strengths. Uh, capturing continuous and discrete heterogeneity is, is notable. It can represent network, spatial context, multi-level nesting. They can capture situated decision making and learning. And what I mean by that is that commonly in ABMs, people make decisions based on their perception of the situation around them. Um, so they may make a vaccination decision or a situation about getting tested themselves or 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 exercising care based not on the just the overall fraction of the population that's been infected, but based on their particular network, you know, how many people they know have gotten sick from COVID-19. Um, they might make masking decisions based on the behavior of peers at work um, or in social surrounds. Um, they may make uh, decisions about vaccination based on what others around them are doing. Um, and, and this situated decision-making where, you know, they have a certain frame of reference and, and they, they look around them as, is often important for for many understanding many types of behaviors. Just like if you want to simulate cars on a road network and why traffic jams form, you need to take into account the people's view of the situation. Their braking behavior, by extension, um, reflects what they can see now. So if they see lights ahead, if there's a hill in front of them and they can't see over it, if it's raining or snowing heavily, they're gonna alter their, their behaviors, um, but their behaviors will be coupled to those around them. If the person ahead of them is breaking, those themselves break, et cetera. This is a very, the next point is a very important one. And many people talk about the distinction between agent-based and or, or individual-based and, and, and um, uh, aggregate models miss this. An aggregate model is, ladies and gentlemen, such as we've been discussing in class, um, captures an evolving uh, situation from a cross-sectional perspective. It says that at any one time, let's say, how many susceptible people there are, how many exposed people there are, infectious and recovered people. Um, it may give us that information now. And a year from now, it may give us other numbers. Um, and it gives us those over time. And in that sense, at an aggregate level, it's longitudinal. 
Um, what it doesn't tell us is, you know, this individual who was infected a year ago, are they the, you know, we, we know a year ago there were 100 people infected. And now we know a year, you know, a year later, 200 people infected. Are those 200, do they include all the people who are, who are infected a year ago and plus more? Or is, are these two different groups or the 200 drawn from across the population? Um, are there some people who remain there all the time? Are there some frequent flyers that get infected many, many times where many people don't? That's a really important and practical questions uh, when it comes to designing interventions um, um, targeted at, at different groups, uh, perhaps targeting people by the number of times they've tested positive previously. Um, think about that for an STI clinic uh, where the frequent flyers are, are treated with, with special um, counseling, perhaps. Um, uh, here, um, that longitudinal information is really valuable for interventions for calibrating the model against individual level longitudinal data from the world or statistics that are longitudinal in nature and many other characteristics. Um, uh, ABMs also allow us to characterize intervention effects and implement intervention implementation at a finer grained level than we typically can in, a, in an aggregate model and allow for for capturing of some of the targeting of interventions, the design the mechanics of delivering them and, and, and the way in which they work um, in, in a very fine-grained way, distinguishing between different types of interventions in a quite uh, precise way. Um, visualization at an individual level often aids communication and intuition. There are some stakeholders for which an aggregate lens is perfectly comfortable, even desirable, or preferred. Uh, demographers are sometimes in this case. They're used to dealing with compartments of, of, of people in the population. By contrast, um, clinicians tend to deal with people as individuals, and, and they often will resonate more with, with a model showing individuals in a way they can, they can understand and appreciate. And they, they, they look for that portrait to develop confidence and understanding of the model. And this allows us Having that individual level characterization allows us to present to some stakeholders aggregate numbers. And stock and flows are very useful ways of thinking about that, asking about why is this kind of people of these characteristics going down, even if the model is not articulated, the dynamics of the model are not calculated with stocks and flows. It's a, it's a useful way to think about it. Um, but beyond that, um, uh, calculating things in terms of, um, uh, you know, or, or using an individual like based lens allows us to focus at, at dynamics at an individual level uh, as well in ways that can inform discussion, uh, enrich comparisons with empirical experience and data, um, design interventions. Um, and then from a data science perspective, it's notable that that with an agent-based model, we can pretty much produce the sort of statistics we get from real-world data, whether at an individual level, at an aggregate level, at a spatial level, at a network level, and in all different ways, in a way that's very handy, because we can test inference mechanisms, for example, means of inferring what's going on in the system against synthetic ground truth. Ground truth from an ABM, which can be used to test a method because we know the true situation in ABM in a way we don't in the world. Um, so we can test an inference method that we want to apply to real world data against, you know, in a training context where, where we're comparing it against the situation where we know the right answer and we're seeing where its blind spots are, where its uncertainties are, where its strengths are, et cetera. Um, uh, there's many trade-offs with aggregate models. The point of this session is not to sort of talk about the detailed trade-offs. Um, uh, the world would be much poorer um, and we'd be really hampered in a scientific uh, and practical progress if we didn't have both traditions to draw on. There's no shortage of people out there who are partisans of one approach or another. Almost without exception, they've never tried in a substantive, authentic way, more than one approach. Um, they, they sit back in an armchair conversation and, and 
opine on why theirs is better than any others and others are not needed. And let me tell you, after 30 years of experience applying multiple techniques, all are needed. Um, I won't go into this more, but there are unique insights that come from aggregate models and unique insights that come from individual based models. Um, and, um, uh, and in fact, some of the richest modeling of all, some of the most practical and insightful modeling these days goes on with hybrid models that bring them together. These are not, ladies and gentlemen, two solitudes. These are highly complementary, even synergistic approaches that each enrich the other and combine together in a single model. They offer a potent vehicle for learning over time in a way that is at once uh, practical, uh, insightful, um, and at the same time nimble um, by allowing you to adjust the, the, the boundary between these techniques. What, what you're characterizing an individual model, uh, level model in your, in your characterization and what in an aggregate model. And in, in other forms, um, I've, I've presented a set of about five compelling patterns for hybrid modeling that I won't talk about today, but you should be aware that it's not a truth of either or. It's, it's often a savvy modeling projects use both types of lenses either in tandem or richly uh, intertwined uh, to secure insights. Um, and both are extraordinarily uh, empowering and, uh, and insightful. So those are my conceptual comments. And uh, I am going to stop this report.